I am so pleased to be here, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Richmond and Claudia Medina and all of the staff for putting this program together and for including me, and, and thank you for letting me talk to you during your lunch hour. So you heard about a tremendous amount of resources that are available to you locally, and what I hope to talk to you a little bit about is to get you inspired, talk a little bit about what the process is for advocacy, getting engaged in advocacy, and then talk about what some of the issues are. And of course, you heard uh, from Claudia what, what some of the local issues are and what they're working on nationally as well. So you'll hear some overlap. So in COPD advocacy, the, the numbers really tell us that um, we've got 12 million people who are, who are diagnosed, another 12 million who are undiagnosed. Third leading cause of death. This is the third leading cause of death, and yet at our premier center, in the United States that's funded with, with, uh, with our tax dollars, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we do not have a dedicated COPD program in the Chronic Disease Division. Okay, so most of the work that they've done at the CDC has been focused on uh, clean air and tobacco cessation and things that are really important from a larger public health perspective, but they do not have programs that are, that are geared towards recognizing people who are living with this disease. You heard uh, from Dr. Sue and others about the cost of COPD to our nation in 2010. It's projected that the cost will be $49.9 billion. Billion dollars. And this is a tremendous burden to, to our uh, healthcare system, the cost of treating individuals with COPD. And yet, we know from some simple data and some simple studies that if we do early interventions, appropriate treatment and management, uh, lifestyle changes like tobacco cessation and pulmonary rehabilitation programs, and oxygen therapy, and a simple disease management program that people with COPD have better health outcomes and less hospitalizations. So one of the things that happened during the Affordable Care Act, which we also call health care, it's colloquial, colloquially called health care reform, is that um, MedPAC took a look at the data for Medicare hospitalizations. And they saw that one of the top hospital readmit rates within 30-day periods of time were individuals with COPD. So COPD now is being recognized for its cost, but we, but we have to make sure as advocates that the other side is recognized as well. And that's the diagnosis and appropriate treatment of people and, and their families as well. And so I would encourage you as COPD advocates, and that means whether you're a patient or, or a healthcare professional or another type of professional that's engaged in, in, uh, in COPD advocacy, that you bring your family with you. Uh, this, has a heavy, this is a disease that has a heavy toll on the family. Let's talk a little bit about being an effective advocate. In my opinion, there are levels of advocacy. There's a hierarchy of advocacy. So there are people, and, um, and Valerie's shaking her head yes, she knows this because she's worked in building a coalition in the state of Hawaii. So she knows there are people who will make, uh, will do a personal letter, they'll make a phone call, or send an email to a member of Congress. There are advocates who will get in, engaged in the next level. They'll write letters to the editor, they'll do social or earned media, and then what we really hope for are, are our champions. Now, I would assume that most of the people in this room are ready to be champions if you haven't been already. Because you're here educating yourselves about COPD and the need to get active in COPD. And so our champions really do things like congressional visits, they do district visits, video testimonials, they attend town hall meetings. Imagine if during the August recess, okay, when all members of Congress go home, we planted Two questions, two questions about COPD in the hands of every individual who had COPD and they went to a town hall meeting and asked that question all across the country, coordinated together at the same time. These are the kinds of things that we're talking about starting to do together, both locally and nationally. We, um, we also encourage individuals to attend press conferences and to hold press conferences about events that are happening regarding COPD. And then 
The highest level of training, we believe, is the peer-to-peer. -peer. So when you have somebody who has actually been active and been an advocate, and they're ready to reach out and recruit other advocates to engage. So, in the hierarchy of advocacy, if you're down here at the bottom and the only thing that you've ever done is pick up the phone and made a call or are gone online and sent an electronic letter, Green California is here to, to help you get to that top level and to be the advocate who is the one who's ready to reach out and educate your peers and tell them about how important it is that we change the profile of this disease. So, um, the COPD Foundation has an action center where you could bring advocacy right to your living room. We have a platform that is, the, that is an electronic basis for our 435 program. So in the United States, there are 435 congressional districts, 100 uh, members of the Senate, and we hope to identify and get individuals to take action in all 435 districts. Um, you can find the phone numbers that you use online with a searchable database at the COPD Action Network and tips for contacting Capitol Hill. When you call to talk to your members of Congress and to, and to uh, talk to them about COPD, it's important that you ask to talk to the individual who handles health in their office. And one of the things that you should know is uh, with regards to a district visit, if you are going in to visit your member of Congress during their recess time, when they're at home, in the district, the chances are very good that you will be able to meet with them in person in the district. However, what you should know is the staff in the district office are usually not legislative staff. The staff in the district office generally work on constituent service. So they're concerned about things that are happening in the local community. They are not working on national legislation. So if you go into the district office and you meet with your member of Congress and their staff, make sure that when you do your follow-up that you follow up with the DC office and talk to the legislative staff in Washington that handles the uh, uh, health care issues. So if you tell them that you'd like to leave a message, uh, you can call them and, um, and, and again, Tell them that you're calling and you want to talk about health-related issues and you'd like to have the person who deals with health return a call to you. Um, we talked a little bit about the district uh, office visits. And Neil, you and Breathe LA coordinate district office visits during the August recess time frame. We absolutely do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and other times as well. So I would encourage you to go in. It's a really nice way to start. You don't have to come to Washington to be an advocate. You can do that right here in your own community and still meet your national representatives. So, um, when you are uh, planning a visit to an elected official, these are the steps that we go through. And I'm going to talk about each of these in an expanded way. You want to decide what your goals are. Keep it very simple. Um, you heard about uh, only addressing one to two to three issues at the most while you're in a, in a meeting because these meetings generally last 15 to 30 minutes. You want to form a team or a network or work with a coalition like Breathe LA. Identify your congressional targets. Develop a clear message. Obviously, you want to make the appointment. And making the appointment is on, there, on the list because that is really about making sure that you're meeting with the right people and then follow up follow-up, follow-up. So, reaching out and having a personal visit and engaging in the process is really only the first step in making sure that you establish a long-term relationship with these individuals who represent you. So, the people um, who you will meet with will ask you what you want. And it's important that you know what they're capable of doing. There are a lot of actions that we can ask them to take, but you also should remain open to suggestions. So for instance, you can ask them to, if there's a piece of legislation you're specifically interested in, you can ask them to co-sponsor the legislation. If it is a regulatory issue, you can ask them to write a letter to the federal agency about the particular thing that you're interested in. There are a whole host of other things that we can do, and there are a long list of them. We have those resources available to you, and I'm sure Breed LA has those on their website. But um, one of the final tips that I would give you when you're deciding your goals is 
when you go in there and make a request, one of the things that I almost always ask for at the end of the meeting is what they would recommend that we do to solve this problem as next steps. It's important to identify your, your uh, partners. You can form a team, a network, or a coalition. Again, the California of LA uh, uh, does all of this for you and designs the agenda. Lobbying has gotten a very bad name, mostly due to an individual by the name of Jack Abramoff. Um, and uh, I want to tell you that lobbying actually is one of the only professions that is defined and protected in the Constitution. You have a right to petition government. That, that is a constitutional right, to petition government. And what you are doing is you are teaching them about what you are interested in and you're letting them know that the decisions that they make impact individual patients and ha individual people and how that impacts. So when you get ready to go on, to, on a meeting or have a face-to-face -face encounter, what you need to know is nobody's going to play gotcha with you. They're not going to start slamming you and asking you questions about the statistics and whether or not you can answer questions about what the Congressional Budget Office has scored this bill, uh, you know, all of the things that we anticipate and develop a lot of fear around is that they're going to ask us questions that we don't know how to answer. What you need to understand is you are the expert. You are living with COPD and you have a right to ask for services, programs, and that the federal government focus appropriately on this disease and on, on, uh, on the services that need to take place for individuals who are living with this disease. The other thing is, if they ask you a question that you can't answer, it gives you an awesome opportunity to go back in to their office and establish follow-up contact. Um, one of the things that, um, that people often don't know or think about when they are getting ready to have a congressional appointment or visit is whether or not their members of Congress are authorizers or appropriators. It makes a difference in terms of what they're able to do. If they're appropriators, they have oversight over federal spending and they're making decisions about how money is spent. If they're authorizers, they have the ability to authorize legislation to, uh, to get things done within the federal government. Also, there are committees of jurisdiction that are focused on uh, health care. And some of the primary committees of concern are Energy and Commerce, Ways and Means, and in the Senate, the Finance Committee. If you do not have congressional leaders who are on those committees, or if your member is an, is an authorizer and not appropriator, and what you want to ask for is more funds, for instance, for the National Institutes of Health, what you really should be thinking about, and, uh, and what we just represented here, is that we have the whole geographic area covered. So working together, you really should be thinking about your state delegation as a whole. So if my member is not an appropriator, but I want to ask for more money for NIH, one of the things that I can ask them for, if I understand what the position is in Congress, is for them to talk to their colleagues who are appropriators within the state delegation and to get them to write that letter and encourage them to take action. So learn about your representative. Decide in advance what you want to tell them. Decide in advance who will speak in the meeting and in what order. And remember that what you want to do is ask for action. You want them to co-sponsor a bill. You want them to join the COPD Congressional <coughs> Caucus. You want them to introduce or support comprehensive COPD <coughs> legislation. So when you get in there, um, it's important that you make the local connection. Claudia talked about this. The fact that there are so many people who are affected with lung disease, it's really hard not to find some way that the individual that you're meeting with can connect with. They, they may have asthma. They may have a family member who's used oxygen. Over a million people use uh, uh, supplemental oxygen. There is an easy way to make a connection and make sure that you make that connection and also keep it local. And then follow up, follow up, follow up, and then follow up. And what, what, what are you supposed to do after that, Ken? <laughs> 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 follow up. 
<laughs> so I really, you should consider that the contact that you make is really just the beginning of the process, as I said, and that it's really based on long-term relationships. And again, if you have approached this properly, which I'm sure that you will, they come to think of you as a resource. So when, th when something comes up where people are talking about respiratory, pulmonary, breathing, uh, um, uh, ventilators, oxygen, inhaled therapies, plasma-based therapies for respiratory disease. I get a telephone call. They think about me when they hear those words. And it may be something that has absolutely nothing to, to do with what's been on my agenda or my organizations that I represent on their agenda, but they'll call me because I have placed myself in a position to be an educator and a resource on COPD and pulmonary.